tonight, an urgent call to deal with the tent encampments that have become a fixture in Canadian cities. It's not normal for people to be living in tents outside. The federal housing advocate calls it a life or death crisis, but warns against clearing the camps. Toronto police are increasing security after pro-Palestinian protesters scaled a Jewish-founded hospital. Have common sense. These hospitals are there to save lives. Why critics say this demonstration went too far. An older housing model getting new life as a potential solution to the housing crisis. People seem really drawn to the idea, and I think it really gives people a greater sense of community. We break down why co-op housing is making a comeback. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin with urgent new calls to address a worsening symptom of Canada's housing crisis, tent encampments, a growing problem in most Canadian cities. Now the federal housing advocate is giving Ottawa a deadline to act. In a new report, Marie-José Oud says the encampments only reveal how broken Canada's housing system really is. She wants all levels of government to cooperate in solving the crisis before next winter. So there's no one easy solution, but it was made clear something needs to change and fast. Thomas Degg shows us the human face of a growing emergency. Is this where you live? Yeah. Can you show us? A tent in a downtown park shouldn't have to be anyone's home. But for a growing number of Canadians, this is it. Not that we're endangering anybody, God forbid, but it's just, it, it's not normal for people to be living in tents outside in, 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 in these situations. With encampments springing up from B.C. to Newfoundland, a new landmark report is warning the federal government of a human rights crisis. How would you describe it? It's like hell on earth. In the federal housing advocate's first ever review of homeless encampments, she blames a systemic failure to uphold the right of all people to adequate housing without discrimination. These are the people that are suffering the most as a result of this housing crisis that we're seeing from coast to coast to coast. Edmonton tore down tents in the dead of winter, while in Halifax, city staff posted notices setting a deadline for people to leave. Now this new report is calling for an end to all forced evictions. This is someone's home and you cannot disrupt this without having a proper place for people to go. The federal housing advocate is recommending Ottawa establish a national response plan by the end of August before the cold starts setting in again. We have to identify what the local solutions are on a community by community basis if we're actually going to solve this problem. There's no easy fix with some people at this Toronto encampment telling us they'd rather stay than go to a shelter. Despite scenes like this, a dangerous fire here in January, just days after a similar incident in St. John, New Brunswick, left 44-year-old Evan MacArthur dead. When you see an encampment, what you're really seeing is people's efforts to survive, literally to stay alive. And so we're in desperate need of a federal response. So Thomas, this report paints a pretty urgent picture. Can you give us a sense of the housing minister's response to it? Yeah, Housing Minister Sean Fraser says the federal government is working on a broader housing strategy to be released in the coming months, not a specific plan for homeless encampments as the federal housing advocate is asking for. Uh, what her report makes clear, though, is going forward, those who need to be consulted are the ones who are most affected by all this, the people living in encampments like the one right here, Adrian. All right, Thomas Daglin, Toronto, thank you. There is outrage and anger tonight after some pro-Palestinian protesters in Toronto demonstrated at a hospital with deep ties to the Jewish community. Stephanie Skenderis breaks down the accusations and the response. In the midst of a march, video shows three men climbing onto the front entrance of a Toronto hospital, one waving a Palestinian flag as some in the crowd chant below. Mount Sinai Hospital was originally created to care for the Jewish community as a response to anti-Semitism. Monday night's protest, disturbing for some. It's well known both for its, uh, its excellent service to the broader community, but also for its proud Jewish roots. 
And the targeting of this hospital was deliberate because of that. And that's anti-Semitism, plain and simple. Political reaction well, has been swift. The federal government came out with a law that you cannot protest on hospitals. Folks, get some decency. Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow called the actions unacceptable and said targeting Jewish institutions is anti-Semitic. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau described it as reprehensible, saying hospitals are places for treatment and care, not protests and intimidation. Protest organizers deny they specifically targeted the hospital. Their demonstration against an Israeli military offensive into Rafah started outside the Israeli consulate and then continued down a main downtown street with several hospitals. Organizers say Mount Sinai just happened to be on their route to the U.S. consulate. There was absolutely no prior conversation regarding Mount Sinai in, in any way. Protester Ali D'Agostino and, was there. Um, a common thing that happens at uh, any kind of march or, or protest. These accusations of anti-Semitism, it's honestly ridiculous and um, shameful and, and unacceptable. This Toronto emergency room doctor says, regardless of the message, this protest went too far. The hospitals are out of bounds for political representation or for voicing of opinions about an armed conflict. Um, it is a neutral ground where people are uh, receiving healing, are re receiving treatment, are having diagnoses made. So, Stephanie, it sounds like Toronto police are now investigating what happened. That's right, Adrian. And police say that interfering with a hospital is unacceptable and that they're increasing security along Hospital Row right here in downtown Toronto. Now, worth noting as well that during the pandemic, the federal government made it illegal to intimidate or to obstruct health care services. Now, Mount Sinai has not commented on whether hospital operations were affected. Adrian? All right, Stephanie Skenderis in downtown Toronto tonight. Now, that planned ground offensive in Gaza South is causing obvious concern in the Middle East as well. About 1.5 million people are sheltering from the war near Rafah. Fighting has continued near displacement camps in Rafah as the Israeli military reaffirms its plans to push forward into the region. The IDF says it will work to evacuate civilians before moving in, but some say they will not leave. As the offensive continues, so have negotiations for a ceasefire with several officials meeting in Cairo to discuss terms for a potential pause. A powerful storm is bearing down on Atlantic Canada tonight after battering the northeastern U.S. There's a mess. Hundreds of schools were closed. Thousands of people lost power. It's the most snow New York City has seen in two years. That system now hovering over Atlantic Canada, which has already been slammed with snow in recent weeks. Some areas still cleaning up from the last storm that at times dumped more than 100 centimeters. Meteorologist Ryan Snodden is monitoring the nor'easter from Halifax tonight. Ryan, can you walk us through its path? Yeah, it is tracking just south of the region, which means that we're into the thick of the snow and the wind tonight across Nova Scotia. We're looking at 15 to 25 centimeters all along the Atlantic coastline, including for Halifax, including for Cape Breton, including for Sydney. Now you may think, well, that doesn't sound like a lot of snow for East Coast storms, but you know what? Uh, Sydney is still digging out from 100 to 150 centimeters just last weekend. So no snow is good snow, especially for the Sydney region. Now, the silver lining here, the heaviest swath of snow, 30 to 50 centimeters, is tracking just offshore, missing Sydney, thankfully. But yeah, St. John's, the Avalon, Eastern Newfoundland, they're into the heart of this one. Totals by Thursday, likely to top 50 centimeters. Now, not just the snow with the nor'easter, but the wind. Snow and blowing snow tonight across Nova Scotia, gusting 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. That continues across Cape Breton through Wednesday. So blowing snow will continue to be an issue there. Eastern Newfoundland, snow and blowing snow, not only Wednesday, not only Wednesday night, but also into Thursday as this one is going to be a big one, a big two day event. And storm surge is also gonna be a concern along that North coast as yes, that those northerly winds push in higher than normal water levels, just in the coinciding with the astronomical high tide there. Adrian. All right, Ryan, thanks for being on top of this. Ryan Snodden in Halifax. Thank you. All right, to Montreal now, where there's been a dramatic spike in the number of fake lawyers scamming newcomers out of cash by promising to handle their immigration papers. 
than failing to follow through. Alison Northcott now with what to look out for and what's being done to protect potential victims. This organization helps refugees settle in Montreal, but staff here have noticed a worrying trend. Newcomers handing over hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to fake immigration lawyers or phony consultants. Anyone that comes and say, I'm a lawyer, they believe it. They pay, but it results that they were not lawyers or consultants and, you know, it has big impacts. Fake lawyers will promise you the moon. The Montreal uh, Bar, which can prosecute fake lawyers in court, says it's been investigating a growing number of complaints around the illegal practice of immigration law. These fake lawyers are approaching their victims on social media and through the web. They'll go to their victims, say that they're lawyers, take on their files, and if they do it at all, most often it'll be poorly done. The consequences can be dire, from serious delays to deportation. That's why the bar launched this campaign, to help newcomers understand the risks and how to avoid them, including verifying a lawyer's credentials. The Canadian Bar Association says fake immigration lawyers and unlawful immigration consultants have popped up in other cities too. It's so easy for someone who doesn't know uh, the, the rules, the law and the regulations to to make a mistake in an immigration application, it's so difficult and challenging to try and fix it after. When people take advantage of you... That and Kit like, okay, Joshi dealt with an unauthorized immigration somebody. consultant in Halifax who never submitted his file. We were like a new to Canada, not even very familiar with the rules and regulations. The only thing was we were trusting the system and the person who was majorly belonging to our own community. Ultimately, he got his permanent residency, but the experience delayed the process and cost him thousands of dollars. The Montreal Bar says when it comes to fake lawyers, look out for red flags, like promises of a quick and easy process, and file a complaint if you suspect wrongdoing. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In Ottawa, a scathing decision from the federal court today, saying the Prime Minister and his Minister of Justice have failed Canadians by letting judicial vacancies build up across the country. Catherine Tunney has more on the ruling and the reaction. In courts across the country, judge positions sit empty, spurring delays with severe consequences. Without judges, there is no justice. So in every aspect of our life where there could be an injustice, we need a judge to fix it. Now a federal court justice is clearly blaming Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Minister of Justice, currently a Ferrani. In his decision, Justice Henry Brown wrote that the Prime Minister and Minister of Justice are simply treading water, that they failed to take action, and went on to write, also failed are all those who have unsuccessfully sought timely justice in federal courts. Ferrani says more can be done. This is my top priority as Minister of Justice. As of February 1st, there were 75 federal judicial vacancies across Canada, including 10 in Quebec, 14 in BC, and 23 in Ontario. Verani says Brown didn't consider that the government has added new judicial positions, meaning there are more jobs to fill. I've been in this role for about six and a half months. I've appointed 64 judges so far, and more. there are more to come. It comes too late for Maggie Goddard. She waited years for her workplace sexual harassment lawsuit to be heard, only for it to be canceled days before it was set to begin because no judge was available. To find out that it was delayed once again um, was crushing. Um, I almost gave up. Goddard eventually settled her case, but says her faith is shaken. I think it just, the justice system takes way too long and it's hard enough for victims to come forward. This is not the first time a judge has warned the government about the problem. Last spring, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court told the Prime Minister the state of judicial vacancies was untenable. But today's decision says little has changed since then, with little explanation why. Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. In Washington, the U.S. House has narrowly voted to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in nearly 150 years. The yeas are 214 and the nays are 213. The resolution is adopted. Just three Republicans oppose the impeachment, the others trying to punish the Biden administration over what they describe as a failure to enforce immigration law at the U.S. southern border. This effort is bound to fail in the Senate, where Democrats have control. 
There's a new warning tonight about a social media app for teens. It's called Wiz. It has millions of users worldwide. As Julia Wong reports, kids using the app could be at risk of harmful content or online predators. It's been compared to Tinder, but for young teens. Wiz is an app where users as young as 12 years old can swipe and meet new friends randomly. And it can be a minefield. There's a lot of like weird people on there. They like to ask for nudes and stuff like that. Probably at least 10 to 15 a day. I thought that it was like just a fun thing um, to download, but in reality, like, it's scary. I don't know these people, and I'm scared that it could be like a fully grown man. Users are supposed to be matched with those around the same age, but that does not always happen. The Canadian Centre for Child Protection says it has received more than 180 reports about Wiz in the last year and a half. The majority of them about sextortion, where someone is persuaded to share intimate images, then blackmailed. What's happening is there are organized criminals that are located in, mainly in uh, Africa who are connecting with youth using this app. Um, they're seeking out youth that are within that age range, the 13 to 17 age range, and they are then extorting them for money. Google says Wiz is not available on Google Play. It was removed from the Apple App Store recently, but is available again for download. The reality is children and youth my age don't always understand the risks of this. Advocates for online youth safety say communication between parents and their teens is critical. They should never feel pressured to do anything that they don't want to do. Teach them exit strategies to get out of uncomfortable situations. CBC News reached out to Wiz but did not hear back. On its website, the company says it's committed to being a secure platform, telling parents it uses experts, AI safety features and works with government bodies. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. New research tonight showing how climate change is making life increasingly difficult for some polar bears. I think what our study was really getting at was, was what are the limitations to polar bears' ability to adapt. What the bears are facing from their own point of view, next. Plus, outrage over a Super Bowl ad. I the Whoever did this obviously doesn't know anything about Newfoundland and Labrador. The calls for it to be removed. And later, an unforgettable moment for a young hockey fan. Oh, it's Lexi! <laughs> Come on in! Give me a hug! <laughs> Her birthday surprise. We're back in two. An offshore oil spill has prompted a national emergency in Trinidad and Tobago. Crews are struggling to contain the oil that's now coating numerous beaches. The spill is linked to a vessel that capsized last week. There is new concern that dwindling sea ice is now bringing some polar bears in northern Canada close to starvation. So using cameras and GPS, researchers effectively traveled with the bears as they searched for food. And as Nicole Mortolaro shows us, what they saw was alarming. Long regarded as an icon of the North, polar bears now face ever bigger challenges from declining sea ice and a rapidly changing climate. A new study led by the U.S. Geological Survey reveals what some are up against, using high-res collar cameras that allowed researchers to almost see through the bear's own eyes. They tracked 20 of them near Churchill, Manitoba, to see how they fared with less sea ice. Forced to spend more time on land means hunting and eating fewer fatty seals, the bear's main food source, resulting in significant weight loss and drops in energy levels. The study found that without those crucial calories, some bears chose to do very little, practically hibernating and living off their fat reserves, while others tried to feed off berries, plants or birds. One bear even swam a total of 175 kilometers in Hudson Bay, resting briefly on the floating carcass of a beluga whale she tried to eat. But overall, the food the bears consumed didn't make up for the energy they spent while foraging. I think what our study was really getting at was, was what are the limitations to polar bears' ability to adapt? And I think that's what we found was that they had all of these different behaviors and a lot of energetic strategies, and none of that was able to prevent weight loss. So 
you know, that just suggests they do have some limitations. Researchers determined that some bears had enough fat reserves to survive until the end of November when the sea ice begins to reform in Hudson Bay. But some might not make it that long. The bears are doing what they've always done. Whatever bag of tricks they've had, um, and they've been using them for probably thousands and thousands of years, um, it's not going to be enough. While not all polar bear populations face the same threats, all are classified as a species of special concern in Canada, mainly due to the loss of sea ice. The question that remains is, will this highly resilient species be able to further adapt to the rapidly changing Arctic environment? Nicole Mortellero, CBC News, Toronto. A Super Bowl ad for a vacation rental company is causing a bit of an uproar for its use of a classic Newfoundland folk song. It's upsetting. Uh, it brings on feelings of being disrespected. How the province is fighting back. Plus, as Canada grapples with the housing crisis, an old idea makes a comeback. The co-op is, to me, it's the, the role for the future because it is affordable. Why some say more co-op housing should be part of the solution. And a black educator reflects on his experience as a student and a teacher. It almost felt as if you were doing well academically, you are giving away pieces of your blackness. Well, his new memoir is resonating with so many. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. I'm excited to be back. I'm very excited. Yeah. Comedian and veteran political satirist John Stewart is getting rave reviews for his first return to The Daily Show since 2015. Why am I back? Uh, you may be asking yourselves. It's a very reasonable question. Uh, I have committed a lot of crimes. <laughs> As the show continues its search to replace Trevor Noah, Stewart will host every Monday night during the U.S. presidential campaign, or as he now calls it... Indecision 2024 Antiques Roadshow. All right. Look. Well, Stewart does acknowledge he's a little grayer, too. Look what time hath wrought. Sunday's Super Bowl made history, with more than 123 million American viewers and 10 million Canadians tuning in. While many enjoyed the nail-biting action, some Newfoundlanders were troubled by one of the commercials. As Heather Gillis explains, it used a beloved folk song in a pretty unflattering way. This looks like an actual farm. It looks cute on the app. <laughs> This Verbo ad has many Newfoundlanders shaking their heads. It uses Eyes the Buys, a popular traditional Newfoundland folk song. He first saw the ad play during the Grammys, then again during the Super Bowl. It's upsetting. Uh, it brings on feelings of being disrespected. Uh, it brings on a sense of Newfoundland and Labrador being subpar. It's personal for Deborah Borden, a tourism operator in Twillingate, one of the towns named in the song. She's the chair of the province's Tourism Industry Association, a sector that rakes in more than a billion a year and employs 20,000 people in the province. I just couldn't believe it, but I just felt like it showed it in such a poor light. I mean, rural Newfoundland, we're quaint, we're warm, we're hospitable, we're all those things. She calls the ad wrong and wants to see it taken down. We have four and four and a half star and five star accommodations located in Twillingate. Verbo says the ad is a dig at their competitors, not people in Newfoundland. Still, the province's tourism minister, Steve Crocker, is calling for the ad to be removed, saying our province offers so much more to Verbo's customers and says it's not an accurate representation of our province, our culture or our people. The department is fighting back with a tourism ad of its own, showcasing what it calls the real Newfoundland and Labrador, using the same song with a very different message. Meanwhile, Saunders says he won't be booking a vacation with Verbo anytime soon. Uh, truthfully, I've never used Verbo before. I certainly will never at this point. The company responded to a senator from this province, David Wells, telling him it's taking steps to remove the ad 
The company also said it's apologized to the tourism minister and anyone else it's made upset. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. A black school teacher draws on his own life lessons to guide and inspire a new generation. I was pushed into athletics simply because I want to race at recess or something like that. But first, just ahead of the latest real estate numbers coming out tomorrow, we get a long view on Canada's housing market. Plus, some creative solutions to the affordability crisis. The cooperative model, it needs to grow. This is The Breakdown. Here to break it all down, we have John Pasalas, president of Realosophy Realty Incorporated. So, John, thanks for joining us. The, the Canadian uh, Real Estate Association is releasing these numbers tomorrow about the housing market. I'm pretty sure there's nothing in that report that's going to surprise you. So, so what are you expecting and what is coming in the world of real estate? We're expecting a, a big rebound from what we saw in the fall. The fall was a very sleepy market. Uh, and we're seeing buyers jump back in. So we're going to see sales up significantly. Price is probably stable, but the big news is that buyers have jumped back into the market. So can we divide this up a little bit? What is this going to mean for homeowners? And what's it going to mean crucially for renters who are such a growing part of the market? So, I mean, unfortunately, very similar trends. So home buyers are finding the market. Prices are still high. Interest rates are still elevated. Uh, they're jumping in because they need a place to live, but it's very unaffordable. Uh, and renters are also seeing a dramatic increase in rents across the country, which is contributing to the high inflation, quite frankly, that we're seeing in Canada. So you, you mentioned interest rates. All of this hinges, right, on, on the Bank of Canada and interest rates. We've been conditioned, I think, in Canada at this point to expect that, that some cuts are coming, mm -hmm. small but real. Um, what's your sense of what will determine whether cuts will come and when? That's a big question. I mean, the challenge is going to be what happens with inflation over the next few months, what happens with job numbers. Again, because that's ultimately going to drive what happens even with fixed rates, and that is what's been driving home buyers right now. Fixed rates have declined. It's fueled a little bit of optimism, and that's why buyers have jumped in. But what are they looking at? Are they looking at the trends in the United States? Or what? Bank of Canada is looking at what's going on in Canada. They want to see a downward path in inflation. And if inflation is sticky, they're going to keep rates a little bit higher longer. And if it looks like we're on that path, we'll see rate cuts a little bit sooner. Is, is anything you're seeing now in the numbers about to be released, for example, going to do anything to make it easier for people to, to own homes in this country? Unfortunately, no. I mean, there's no immediate fixes to Canada's housing crisis. You know, we have uh, our government's doing a lot to drive up supply, but of course that takes a long time. We've had a big demand shock with our population boom that has put pressure both on home prices and on rents, so there's no immediate fixes, unfortunately. We can't leave it like that, though, okay. right? There has to, I, I know that you talk about solutions yep, all the time. For so, sure. So where do you see some? You know, one thing I think we want to see is, is really more investment, I think, into non-market housing. And we're starting to see that, federal governments, municipal governments. And that is, you know, people who are looking for housing that are not paying market rents because that is not going to solve all of our housing crisis. So I think those are steps that governments can take to provide some relief for some of the, the households who can't afford today's prices. But doesn't that mean that governments have to buy the housing? Or, or nonprofits have to buy the housing? Exactly, not necessarily buy the, but nonprofits, and exactly, that's correct. So it's a nonprofit housing, and that's why it's significantly more affordable for the people who cannot pay today's market rents. And I think that we need more government investment in non market housing. All right, we could talk to you about this all day, John Salas. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's focus on one of those non market solutions. About 250,000 Canadians already live in housing co ops. Talia Ricci breaks down why they've been so popular through the years. The co-op has opened its doors to everyone. Canada's first co-op apartment building. Because managing a co-op means new responsibilities. Today, the co-op buildings you see around the city are like relics of a bygone era, both when it comes to the architecture and also the cost of living in one. This nonprofit co op in Riverdale is likely one of the oldest in the province. A one bedroom here goes for, get this, $1,100, and a four bedroom, $1,800. To give you a bit of context, the average one bedroom in Toronto right now is around $2,500. Needless to say, the people who live here love it. This would be considered one of the bigger kitchens. Um, 
some of them just have literally a, a strip of a galley kitchen. As John says, there's balconies in all the units, which I didn't know. I assume most of them. If you went and saw five other units today, each one would be completely different than the other. They all have pretty small bathrooms. These places are homes and the whole breadth of life happens within them and spills outdoors because we have these big courtyards and sometimes it can be noisy and you're not in the mood for noise, but overall we cohabit pretty darn well. And you also probably won't be surprised to hear that for the lucky few who locked down a co-op unit over the years, they tend to stick around. As long as you're paying the monthly charges and abiding by the rules, you are welcome to stay as long as you want. Anyone can apply, but lists to get into these buildings are years long, and members' families sometimes get priority. I moved here when my son was two, and he's now 35. And my daughter just moved here in December, and so I have grandkids here now too. I've lived here for 40 years. Maybe, yeah, I moved in in the mid 80s. I'm particularly attracted to the self-management uh, process of it. There's a, we're always encouraged to be on these committees. We have a, a, what we call a residence council, which uh, involves with all the major decisions about uh, how, the, how, how the place is run. So let's take a moment to explain what exactly a co-op is. First, we should differentiate between a non-profit and an equity co-op. Those are the ones you see listed for sale. You buy a share of the building, which is your unit, and you need the approval of the board to move in. But the type of co-ops we're talking about today are registered as not-for-profit corporations. This is over 90% of existing co-op housing stock in Canada. Members jointly own and manage the building they live in. The monthly housing charges are designed to cover expenses with surpluses reinvested into the co-op. The members do not build equity in their housing. If they move, their home is offered to another household. Everyone who lives in a co-op um, decides, you know, what the policies are, what the budgets are, the monthly housing charges, um, you know, approval of certain capital expenses, repairs, um, some of the community programs that they put on. It's all um, a joint model that every member of a co-op contributes. Most co-ops were created between the 70s and the 90s. So what happened between the 90s and today? Basically, money from the government to operate these buildings slowed down. Then the housing market exploded and the population grew. And now, here we are in a housing crisis due to a lack of supply. And co-op buildings are back on the government's radar. We talked to Ontario's Associate Minister of Housing about this. Why we're hearing about it now is, is we're at 15 and a half million people going to 20 million pretty quickly, and we need all kinds of housing. And the cooperative model, the cooperative component, is an important part of that strategy. It needs to grow. The province recently announced additional funding to support current co-ops and build new ones as part of its investment into housing. Well, let me give you an example about the Kennedy site. So we removed development fees, right, for purpose-built rentals, which the cooperative model falls under. So that alone saves that site approximately $1.5 million of fees they would have had to pay before that housing uh, initiative. Um, as well, we removed the HST, the provincial portion. This is the site he's talking about. It's currently a commuter parking lot. It's not much to look at yet, but it's going to be a pretty exciting and substantial project in Scarborough. And that's what really has people talking about co-op housing making a comeback. And this is the first co-op we've seen uh, kind of come forward for around a generation and it's on the back of the city's land. So this is city land uh, that we invited partners to kind of tell us what they thought they could do with it. And what we're seeing is this great kind of mixed use project. It's got community space, it's got retail, it's right next to a transit hub and it's got both market ownership but importantly for us over 600 new uh, co-op homes. Abby Bond says the city hears a lot of feedback from the community about wanting more co-op housing. And it's a form of housing that's been proven to be successful. People are happy, they can live comfortably and work in their communities. So the fact that this is actually now happening is a big deal and could serve as a blueprint for more projects like this. People seem really drawn to the idea and I think it really gives people a greater sense of community, a greater sense that they can live here for the long term, they can make their home here. 
It's a personal choice whether or not you love the idea of being a little more involved in your community. Doing things like gardening and making big decisions about your space alongside your neighbors. Co-op members tell me at times there are challenges, but it's a lifestyle they love and one they hope that future generations get the chance to experience. It's a, a really kind of grassroots engagement in terms of living situations, which is really, really energizing and positive for you know people living here. It's not that they're not challenges. There's some serious challenges, but at the same time, it's it's a it's a it's it, it's quite an amazing, rich experience living here. I watched my kids try to get apartments in Toronto. Apartments in Toronto are insanely expensive. I, I don't know. Like I walk around and wonder who lives in there, who can afford that? And the co-op is, to me, it's the, the role for the future because it is affordable. So Talia, there, there's another big sign of renewed interest in co-ops. Can you walk us through that? Well, Adrian, the 2022 federal budget included $1.5 billion in funding and loans. Part of that is set aside for a new cooperative housing development program. The program was sent to launch earlier this year, but the group that will work with the government on that, the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada, says it still doesn't have an exact date. Okay, people will be watching that. All right, Tally Ricci, thank you. Coming up, a Canadian teacher's new memoir on the barriers faced by black boys in the education system. I have a lot of friends and even family members that um, you could say were impeded by education. The message he's trying to pass on to the next generation of teachers. teaches black boys to work past stereotypes that sabotage them in school. You can exist in a way where you feel comfortable, but you can also do well in school. His message is spreading, his memoir is out, but former students already know what he's all about. He understands the things that would hold you back. So have things improved since he was in school? Matthew R. Morris now instructs future teachers using lessons he learned from life. Deanna Sumanak Johnson got him to break down some of that wisdom. It is important to like be yourself. Like that is true transcendence of education. Like just being comfortable enough to show up in the classroom. When Matthew Morris tells these aspiring teachers at Brock University to bring their whole selves to the classroom, he means it. This Toronto middle school teacher has positioned himself as an important voice on how the education system treats black boys and young men first with a TED Talk called the Fresh Prince Syndrome. Will represented that quintessential young urban black male. And we could come up with a dozen more character traits about Will and the Fresh Prince. But not one of them would embody what we idealize as the universal student. The Fresh Prince Syndrome is a benevolent ailment that plagues urban black males. And now a book, a memoir called Black Boys Like Me, it caught the eye of a major publisher and, shortly after its release, cracked into the top 10 bestsellers list of nonfiction, a spot usually reserved for celebrity bios. Not a common fate for a memoir by a middle school teacher. I started to reflect on my own experiences as a black male and my experiences as they related to schooling. And um, as I write about in the book, you know, I have a lot of friends and even family members that um, you could say we're impeded by education and we're impeded by school. Morris grew up in Scarborough, a son of a white mother and a black father, in a household sometimes short on money, but never on love. A strong student and athlete, he eventually played U.S. college football on a scholarship while he completed his undergraduate studies. Still, even as he thought of himself as Superman, he says he received messages in school that tried to limit what he should strive for. When I was in elementary school very early, um, I was pushed into athletics simply because I won a race at recess or something like that. When I could have been pushed into science or academics because to be quite honest, education and schooling at that time wasn't necessarily difficult for me and I got decent grades. There were also not so subtle messages like being stopped by the police just because of his arm tattoos or the fact he was a young black man driving an expensive car. Were those things that you went through as a young man, did they play into your decision to not become an athlete or a business person or a lawyer, but to be yeah. a teacher? Yeah, they did. You know, I, um, I wanted to be able to 
come back to a community where I was born and raised in and on a one-to-one -one level show young black males that you can exist in a way where you feel comfortable and a way that is still stitched to your community and your aesthetic but you can also do well in school. And that's the thing he always did was went the extra mile. Matthew Morris's um, former okay. student Nathan Barnaby graduated high school and wants to go to college to study carpentry. It was very cool to see a teacher with so many tattoos. Um, he had a very nice fashion sense, which I was drawn to. That initial connection built a deeper one when Nathan started not paying attention in class. He understands the distractions. He understands the things that would hold you back. So um, when he comes to me, he just talks to me like, oh, I want to see you to your fullest potential. It goes to show how, how far he's come in such a short period of time. Another former student, Sean Morgan, is about to become a Toronto police officer. I think seeing him in a role such as teaching, it kind of pushed me to be into a role of policing because I want people to feel represented when they see me, when they see me on the force. So are things any different for black boys and young men than they were when Matthew Morris was growing up? Recent years led to major conversations about race in education. Ontario just became the first province to make black history mandatory in middle and high school. Streaming has been abandoned in many provinces because it was found to disproportionately steer black students away from higher education. We are at the starting block, so to speak, a moving starting block where conversations are happening and actionable items are starting to occur. We're not getting into the nitty gritty aspects of what are the true prob problematic issues around equity and around race and around racism. So it's gotten better. It's better now than it was when I first started teaching over a decade ago. I think that the idea of starting with conversations is important. I just think that we also need to be cognizant of who we bring to the table when we are having these conversations. Until then, he'll be speaking to young people, encouraging them to be neither Fresh Prince nor Carlton Banks, but something much fresher than that, themselves. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. So school boards around Toronto have done some recent staff censuses. The results show that black people remain underrepresented as teachers, especially black men. Next, a pro hockey player makes a surprise appearance at a fan's birthday party. Lexi just randomly showed up at my house, so I was pretty shocked. Her emotional reaction in our moment. You are looking at Kalia Quintanilla and her friends at her 13th birthday party. Happy birthday, Kalia. She thought it would be kind of a low-key celebration, but her mom had other plans. Her mom got in touch with Kalia's favorite hockey player, Lexi Agia, who plays for the PWHL's Ottawa team, and then they set up a special surprise. Kalia's reaction to seeing her role model just walk through the door makes our moment. Happy birthday! Come on in! Give me a hug! I don't usually start crying, but it just made me so happy. She had expressed to me a few weeks earlier that Lexi was her favorite PWHL player, and I thought, I'm going to ask her if she could do a video call with Kalia and her friends for her birthday, because they're all big fans of Lexi. So I was like, you know, this might be crazy, but if you're from Ottawa, I don't mind stopping by and showing face. I feel like that might be a little bit more meaningful. And I was like, what? This is crazy. Next thing I know, she was like, okay, I'm on my way. <gasps> it's Lexi! I was pretty shocked. I just really look up to her. Happy birthday! She started crying, and that is not something I thought would ever happen in my life. And then the other girls at the party just all walked up and stared at me in shock and didn't really speak. So then I was a little bit speechless. You guys can talk to her. Her coming to the house is definitely a testament to her character, but it, it's also a great demonstration of desire to want to see this sport grow. You want to play in the PWHL one day? Yeah, I want to be like her one day. I, lo I love everything about this Lexi. You are a great Canadian. Kalia, happy birthday. She's already playing at the highest level for girls her age, the, the double A's, and we know you have a huge future. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arson.